Share your enthusiasm and game devs, Tony Chan here, and welcome to episode 70 of Game Dev Loadout, where I chat with the best people in our industry every single week. If you need motivation and tactics for making successful games, then this is the podcast for you. Now let's chat with today's future guest, Jen Senecock. Jen, it is a game time. Are you ready? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you think so? Okay. Uh, Maybe not, actually. Can we have another 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so she found the independent mobile game studio called Inquisiment with the goal of creating experiences that foster friendship, curiosity, and challenge. She is also in the process of creating a series of edible games, which we definitely got to get into later in the show. Uh, because I love talking about food, and I'm curious at, at how you how you got that started. Her works include Thimbleweed, A Park, Against Friends, and L.A. Noir, and much more, of course. Uh, go ahead, Jen. Give us a bit about your personal life and how you got started in the game industry. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, I guess like when I was younger, I loved playing like all different sorts of games, whether that was like um, tabletop board games with my family, or like uh, we played a lot of adventure games, like point and click adventure games, um, and. I never really thought of that as being like a valid career option. Like I went to a very um, snobby traditional type school and like, uh, so the, the, you know, the career paths that we were told were about, you know, lawyers, doctors, engineers and stuff. And so it was only uh, like much later, I I got a degree in engineering, computer science and other stuff. um, And I sort of realized that you could actually make a real career out of, games i partly feel like i was a bit mistaken in that but now i'm I'm (laughs) making a career out of games but yeah (laughs) um so yeah and like once i worked out i was like i thought maybe i was a coder but i'm really a game designer and so when i worked out that i was a game designer that was a really big moment in my life um and i just started making games trying to work towards getting a job in the industry or um yeah So what made you uh, go towards a game designer instead of like a game programmer? Um, So like at the time I was doing um, a master slash PhD in artificial intelligence and I was surrounded by really good coders Uh, and I can code, but I'm not, that's not what I'm best at. And like there was one particular person who was like socially awkward, you know, kind of classic sort of <laughs> Asperger's programmer type person and you know he he was also looking for jobs in the games industry and of course he got a job uh, as a coder and I just thought to myself why am I competing with somebody who I know is a much better coder when I can do a lot of other things much better and it, it was then that I kind of went oh yeah I'm like I'm a designer and I can probably do producing stuff and that's much more fulfilling to me than trying to code. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the same with me. Programming, it just, I just can't get a hold of it for some reason. And I think game design is where uh, I shine, I guess. So let, let's talk about game design. What is something we probably don't know about game design that we should? Whoa, um, I guess that you're going to fail a lot first. <laughs> you could <laughs> prototype a lot. I mean, that's relatively common knowledge, so I don't know. Uh, I guess it's hard to know what people do and do not know. Yeah, so, okay, so let's talk about the failure. So when you say, how, how do you start off your game design? Like, what do you, you want to give us a step of what you do in particular to get your juices flowing when you try and design a game? Um, yeah, I guess I, like, I used the, what is it, the art of um, game design, which talks about lenses. And so often when I'm trying to come up, like, I, you know, I read that ages ago and don't remember most of the details. But to me, the gist of what I get from that is I like to try to tackle a game um, from either a mechanics point of view, an art or story um kind of point of view like so it's kind of like I think it was like three different ways you could start tackling a design um and I'm probably mangling this up horrifically and I apologize for that um and I know for me like art is definitely not a strong point so I would never look at something from um or very rarely would look at something from an art point of view unless I was working with an artist who was like okay you do cool stuff I want to create a game that uses your cool stuff um but generally I I try to take a little core nugget of something and I build from there and so I like to give myself a bunch of constraints I'm like okay it's got to work with such and such tech or I want to do something where you're getting across the story of somebody who is quite happy to never find the one and being single is a good thing for this person or whatever it might be, you know. 
So you're, you're coming from, at it from like a, a more of a story perspective. Well, that one in particular, uh, that particular example I just did, yes. But I also, I mean, gameplay mechanics is probably my real uh, strength. Like sort of thinking of it more as a toy design. Is it like I've heard somebody call it toy design before? But it's like working out what does a player do? How do they interact with this thing? And how do I create just like one gameplay mechanic that resonates really well and that works really well and can be a core of something. And that could end up just being a single feature in a much larger game, or it could be like the core of the game and there isn't anything more. It kind of depends on what uh, style of game I'm trying to do and what sort of team I'm working with. Yeah, that's all, those are good questions to ask uh, your team. Like, well, what, what games, I mean, what, what are you trying to portray? What mechanic is going to hit home run with the players? Yeah, those are really good uh, questions. What mistakes are most common, even at a pro level, when uh, designing games? Not getting it out to either uh, QA testing or just general public testing soon enough. That uh, getting feedback on your game is really important and learning from that um, and not getting stuck in a design. Well, so why do you think people don't do that more often? Uh, I mean, a lot of the time, you know, like when you're making a game, you have this vision for it. And before you kind of finish the game, uh, it doesn't ever feel like it's right. And you get like, I don't, you know, I get self-conscious, you know, I'm like, oh, people won't like it. They won't see the vision or it's not really right. So they'll just concentrate on all the stuff that I know is wrong. Like I know I need to fix this thing. So there's no point showing it to people because all they're going to do is tell me exactly what I know already. And actually they will tell you a bunch of stuff that you don't know already. And if you tell them, Hey, look, I know X, Y, Z isn't working. Can you just give me feedback on other stuff? Then that can be, um, really helpful um but other than that like getting qa testers people often think of that as being something that either they can do themselves or that friends can do or that can be done really late in the process but it's much better to get early on so that you can constantly be building something that is less buggy because if you're like taking buggy code and adding more bugs to it then by the time you give it to a QA tester you're going to have like these epic bugs that are going to be impossible I mean you're always going to have bugs that are going to be impossible to find <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and, and uh, I think that's the one thing uh, I guess the new game developers have to overcome is just putting your game out there you know finally showing the world uh the stuff you're creating and you, you gotta take in those feedback and you know, in a way, you have to build up that thick skin to handle the, the feedback because, you know, it does hurt because you put a lot of love into the game and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, totally. I mean, some of that is just finding a good group of people to be around. Like, I go to a meetup every fortnight where people bring in games in all different sort of stages. Some of them are just like an idea on a piece of paper and others are like, I'm hoping to ship this soon. Can you give me some final tweaks or something? And everybody in that group very much, like, they give – constructive criticism and so making sure you find people who aren't just going to say oh it's shit uh, i don't like <laughs> it make it better you know like you want people to say oh no i don't i don't like this particular thing i think that maybe if you tried this it could be better or whatever it is oh yes join your local community that gives constructive feedback uh, overall what are your key principles especially for when you're making your own games like what are your key principles for making sure the game is well designed I don't know if I have key principles. <laughs> I think to me a lot of good design is kind of gut feeling. So it's, uh, I mean, not always, but it's, it's <laughs> and, yeah, I know. And now I'm sounding terrible. I think it's partly because this, like the games that I work on, they're all very different. Like I've worked on a AAA game. I've worked on educational games. I've worked on like hidden object social games. I've, did um, a, a little mobile game. I've worked on an adventure game. I'm now doing my edible games. And they're all really different. And knowing what makes good game design is very different for each one of those games and genres. Um, so I guess to me, good game design is kind of really about uh, showing it to players. And if players understand it, like if they grok it, then that's a good thing. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. If they understand it, it's good. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the, the edible games. How did you come up with this idea? Like, where did, where, what's the origin of this? 
I mean, it's been bumbling around in my noggin for quite some time. I um, I have loved baking for like as long as I can remember, and I like games. Um, and then I guess slowly over time, something kind of clicked, and I went, "Oh, I can actually turn this into a something." And guess yeah, it was just an evolution. So uh, I guess then game I was like, "What what exactly is animal games?" So I know there's other people who do some stuff where there's food-based games or food is somehow related into the games. For me, what makes um, the games that I want to try to work on for edible games be interesting is the eating is uh, one of the core gameplay mechanics. So if you didn't eat, you can't play the game. So that somehow eating like changes something significant about the game or the board or it gives you information that other people don't have or it's it's something it's something real um and not just um like oh hey i captured this person's porn now i'm going to eat it um uh, that's that's interesting but it's i'm trying to go for an extra layer on top of that how many different edible games have you made so far uh, i've got six that are really solid right now i've got a seventh that's pretty good but needs a bit of tweaking and i'm aiming to create a dozen or maybe even a baker's dozen of games whoa i'm curious uh, it, is it kicking off it's like how are, are other people taking to it are people i mean so i did it a lot on it um last year and i got to show it at a lot of places and it seemed to do really well like i showed it at indicate and i even got an award which was just oh, wow. phenomenal i was shocked by that and then this year i've um it's had to kind of take a bit of a, a back seat because i've been working a lot on simboy park and i was recently working on a game that was a tabletop game that was enhanced by the amazon alexa which was a super fun project but it meant i couldn't work on my edible games. So I'm kind of just this week jumping back in and and heading forward and my current goal is to create a cookbook and try to kickstart that cookbook. You worked on so many different types of games, triple A, indie, then you got an award <laughs> for making edible games. See, now just think about how the future is going to be like, you know, because we have VR, then AR, then mixed reality, then edible games might be something huge in the future. You just we never know. <laughs> That'd be insane. <laughs> I never thought about it. And I love food too, so Uh, I'm looking forward to it when your idea kicks off like uh, mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thanks. Now, let's go on a more personal level. And you, you've been in the industry for a while now. Tell us about the worst moment of your career, that one moment that's still vivid in your mind. Be very detailed and tell us that personal story. Um, yeah, so I... I don't know. I've had a number of bad moments in my career. <laughs> Give us that one that just pops in your mind. What, what time is it? Um, I, I mean, there was one particularly where I was told I was jeopardizing my career. Um, like this was working, um, you know, in a studio that didn't necessarily respect time off very much. I don't want to name names. Um, but one of the things I did to try to increase morale was I would um, bake a cake once a week and bring it in for everyone to, you know, hang out. And Aww. it was really – it was good for me to be able to meet people in the studio who I want, who I needed to work with. Like as a designer, you kind of need to work with a really big range of different people. Um, and so it was useful for that. Um, but then management just started thinking that we were always slacking off and eating cake even though this was like a once a week kind of thing and so I got told that if I was going to keep bringing in cake I was like jeopardizing my career in games and so yeah that was a pretty crappy moment what in the world how, how, how is someone disallowing free cakes in, in for the company come on now <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty outrageous and it was definitely something that made me kind of think about where I wanted to be in the sort of companies that I want to work for or create myself if I'm creating a company. Um, you know, and, and it's like I knew that was a contract gig and that wasn't going to last forever or, you know, I wasn't going to be there forever. And it's just about, yeah, like time off once a week is important and helps people recoup and makes for better workplaces overall. We we heard about this, you know, crunch time or being overworked or, or, you know, just taking time off, like you say, could look bad on yourself or for certain companies. What do you want to make sure a game does a take away from that experience in case like my, myself, I want to join the game industry. But then I hear all these stories about, you know, crunch time and how, you know, I don't know if a lot of company does it, but, you know, we know that some does like I want to encourage game does that from what I hear, the game industry is a great place to work at. You just 
crunch time moments or something like what can we take away from that experience I think game development's hard like if you look at say the film industry they've kind of got making films down a bit more pat than we do making games so that some people when making films know very precisely that it's going to take x months with games for whatever reason whether the like we're trying to do more different sort of things that are non-linear it's much harder so you're probably going to encounter crunch whether it's from uh your company forcing you or or the company culture encouraging you to or whether it's just yourself like even like as an indie i feel like a lot of indies talk about oh well you know i did all this work and i never slept to release this game and look my game's a success therefore yay and it feels like it's like you know a Uh, like just something that you have to do to be able to make a successful game. And if you're not going to crunch, you're not going to make a successful game. And, and that attitude is okay if you're okay with it. But if you value things in the rest of your life um, highly, then you just got to go into it with open eyes and go, uh, like, it's like, do you want to be a short term game developer or is this going to be for the rest of your life? Right? Like if you're like, well, I'm going to make some great games for like, you know, five years and then I'll probably get burnt out because I'll have put all my life in it. Maybe that's okay. Maybe you want to just like do the best that you can in a short period of time. But if you're going into it for a long haul, you've got to, uh, you've got to make choices and make choices that are right for you. Whether that means your games, like if you're as an indie and it means your game's going to get delayed by six months, then just live with that, like own it. Yeah, give yourself time. And our health is more important than releasing the game. So do you want to give advices or do you want to tell those company that does crunch time? Like, what do you want to tell them so they could help prevent <laughs> crunch time? I think preventing crunch time comes from so many different factors. Like if you're starting out and working out, working on your own stuff, like if you don't have any form of like crunch time comes from some amount of pressure, right? You've got to finish something by a certain date or milestone. And if you don't have any pressure, then you're never going to ship a game. So you do need some amount of pressure. It's about working out where that, where that limit is. So I guess, I guess, I mean, I, I don't feel like I can talk for big studios because to me, a, a lot of those problems come from upper management and they're never going to listen to us and they're so set in their ways. If you're like an underling, give yourself limits, like work six days a week for a certain amount of time, but never work seven days or like, and just let that be no. And, and if that means that you lose your job, you've just got to go, okay, well, I would have lost you know, my health if I had stayed there. But yeah, and if, and if you're an indie, just make choices about what's important to you and say, well, I'm going to work at most X hours per week and set up a little timesheet and then track your hours. Yeah, set up set up boundaries and, and like James just say, track your hours if possible because this podcast is to help motivate you to make gains, but I don't want to do... I don't want to motivate you at the cost of your health. So I highly encourage you to set up boundaries and exercise as well, which is good for your health. In your profession, like, do you hear any bad recommendations you hear in your profession? Mm, uh, I mean, I think most people know that this is like untrue now, but like the sort of build it and they will come kind of fallacy. Like if you build a great game, people will see it and it'll be awesome. And When you say to people, actually, no, I know people who've made great games and they haven't done well. They're like, well, give me an example. And, you you know, you could potentially give them examples like, well, I've never heard of that. So therefore it's crap. And I'm like, well, no, it's a (laughs) good game. You just haven't heard of it. There is plenty of good examples. But, but, you know, with survivorship bias or whatever it is, people often only see like game X was good and did well. Game X, you know, wasn't good and didn't do well, you know. They don't necessarily see all of the thousands and thousands of games that are coming out all the time these days. Yeah, and that's why marketing is so important. You got to put your game out there early so people can see it. And, uh, you know, as you build out your game, your community grows with you. And, And for game development, what is the biggest waste of time? Biggest waste of time, spending too long, preparing, and not enough time doing. Oh, you want to expand upon that? I guess I just mean, like, you can 
you can plan for a really long time. Actually, I'm, and I'm falling <laughs> a little bit victim for this at the moment. Now I'm finally able to work on my edible games. I'm like, okay, let's start planning out what the hell I'm going to do. And, you know, it's much better just to make, just to do. Like what you're going to do is probably wrong and we'll need revisions and stuff. But just, you know, it's like spending ages on a game design doc. Don't, don't do that. That's just stupid. Just make something and show it and then iterate. Like if you're on a big team and you need to communicate ideas, like put some stuff in a game design document, sure. But otherwise just start doing like examples, particularly in games, examples are much more powerful than any amount of words. Yes, yes. Take action on your ideas, game devs. You know, just stop waiting. There's no reason to wait. You just got to take action and, and get going. What have you changed your mind about in the last few years and why? I don't really know. I've probably changed my mind about too many things. I guess I guess it's like more about knowing your limitations. Like I did A Glimpse Friends and I'm really proud of that game, but like it was a total failure. Like barely anybody downloaded it. It was, you know, and I knew it was going to be tough, but it's it's like I was trying to do a free to play game as a solo dev. And that's just not like, it's not possible in this day and age. Nobody can do that no matter how amazing you are. So just know, know your limitations or know what scale you're going for. Mm. What are you going to change after that experience? Like, what have you learned from that? So I guess I've, I've learned to only try to make things that, me or the team that I'm working with can feasibly do. So like my edible games is about making a cookbook and designing a bunch of games. And yes, I'm going to need some help, but I'm not going to, like, it's not like I need to have 20 different people helping me. I only need a bit of time from, you know, somebody who knows how to lay out books um, and somebody who can do a video for the Kickstarter or things like that. Like it's, it's something that I can kind of do. And if it's about making a book, then that's pretty scalable compared to, I'm not going to start making um, cooking kits that people can buy in a shop. Like that's a cool idea, but it's not something I would be any good at being able to do. And it's not very scalable. Mm, Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Now that you are more experienced and better, what do you think was the one best investment you've ever made? It can be investment of money, time or energy. What's the best investment you made? Not letting myself be stagnant to always like push myself to do new stuff. So like when I decided I wanted to get into the games industry, I was in Australia and there was very few um, game development jobs at the time. And so I just started a project where I came up with a new game idea every week for the year. And, you know, one of my edible games was in that, uh, in that project. Um, It's, you know, and that was what, what, eight, nine years ago, I don't know, eight years ago, probably. And yeah, I think it was, and, and then, you know, it's, I guess throughout my career when I'm like, oh, I'm kind of stuck. I'm not necessarily excited about exactly what I'm doing right now. It's about, well, I'm just going to start coming up with new ideas, implementing stuff, pushing myself. Love that. Yeah. Once you, you, I'm pretty much at that stage right now where in my job, I just feel like I've been doing it too long and it's time for something new. So that's why I've been pushing myself to do the podcast and to join the game industry. So if you're in that mode where you're just feeling stable now or it's just too uh, stagnant, it's time to do something new. It's time to you can't be doing the same thing over and over. So you got to do something fun, something exciting. Aside from your edible games, like what was some other great ideas you had to date? Like an aha moment. I guess there's a bunch of like little things that I felt like have been really good, like working on a team with other people. And I'm like, oh, you know, we should totally do do this. Like in, um, in Thimbleweed Park, um, we wanted to have a hint system in the game and then like kind of, just like having this aha moment, realizing that we could make it as though it was a phone line that you call up, um, such like hint lines were kind of like that back in the 80s and 90s. You would dial up a number and kind of realizing, oh, great, this fits in with the fiction of the game and it fits in, like it doesn't feel weird and it's something that I can just kind of do, which I did. And so I think I think all my, I mean, it's a long-winded way of saying, like I think my aha moments have been more 
like little things like realizing how stuff kind of fits together or fits in with the team or adds to an existing um, setup. What's the game industry like booming now? You know, the, the Switch is popular. The PS4 has a lot of great games. The Xbox X is almost out. What are you most excited about today in the game industry? I don't know. I'm actually not that excited about the game industry. What? I find it really depressing. There's so many games out there. Like, it's, <laughs> it's really overwhelming. You look at the statistics on Steam and otherwise, it's just, you know, it's, it's so easy for people to make games, which is a good thing because you get a bunch more different voices out there. But then it's really hard to find the good games out there. So... I don't know. I guess I'm excited in the games industry is that you don't have to make violent games, you know, that I've not ever been very interested in violent games and it's really good that that there's some decent large games out there that are not about killing people. Yeah, yeah. What is the one game that influenced you the most and why? Uh, it's, it's probably a toss-up between Leisure Suit Larry and Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> so Leisure Suit Larry just, well, and I guess also Monkey Island, like adventure games when I was a kid, they just really spoke to me. It was just something that I could play with my brother and sister who were older. Like I never actually got to control them or do anything. It was always them controlling, but I still felt like as the youngest I could contribute. And so I think that kind of family even though I must like playing games by myself, it's kind of weird. I don't know how that influenced me, but I think that was just like realizing that like video games can appeal to a lot of different people. And then I think Fahrenheit, which was a game by Quantic Dream who did like heavy rain and stuff. I think it was called Indigo Prophecy here in the States. I think I just liked the way they played with different mechanics that they it was just interesting to go, oh, look at look at the way they've done this. Look at how they're manipulating my emotions. Yeah. Are you excited about their new game? I believe it's called Detroit. I didn't even play their last one that they'd done. No, I I haven't followed along. I think I think David Cage kind of started to annoy me. And <laughs> <laughs> Why do you love being part of the game industry? Because I love being able to be to do technical things, but also be like super creative. Uh, I love all of the possibilities of what I can do and I love being able to create more positive experiences for people out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's what's so great about games. It's a really social experience. It's really positive too if if people play in a positive way. It's just I love being uh, part of the video game industry and spreading that out there. Awesome. The game isn't over yet, Game Dust. Before we head into the lightning round, if you enjoyed the episode and want to hear more inspiring stories, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And so, Jen, I will ask you a quick question so you'll be giving us a ton of valuable information in return. Are you ready to crush it and release the show? <laughs> sure. Yes. What was holding you back from joining the game industry? Uh, not thinking it was a valid career option. What's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Oh, never stagnating, always pushing myself. Always pushing. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I don't know. Oh, I know. Come in, coming up with like your three core values for yourself. Like what, what are you all about and what's important to you? Do you mind sharing yours? Yeah, it's friendship, curiosity, and challenge. Oh, oh yeah, just like in your company's uh, statement, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's kind of you can use it as a company statement. I can use it for what uh, is important to me in games or sort of personally. How has a failure set you up for a later success? Made me be able to look out for better warning signs and uh, being uh, more cautious um, and asking for help and uh, recognizing when I should just quit. I think, although I haven't actually quit, but I should quit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> How would someone recognize that moment? Like uh, we talked about this a few times on the show. Like, how would someone recognize when it's time to give up on a product? Maybe one would be like the users are not liking it. But what would be other reasons? The you're unhappy working on it. Um, like oh. if, if it's your main thing. If 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 it's just making you miserable all the time. Like particularly if you're an indie, why why are you making yourself be miserable? That's just ludicrous. Yeah, or. Like, I mean, I think just financially, right? Like, I mean, we have to pay rent and if 
you're struggling to pay rent and your current project isn't helping you pay rent, God, stop it. Yeah, if, if you're hurting financially, you got, you got to think twice. What's a, a great marketing tip to make yourself and your game stand out? Oh, God. Like, whatever marketing tip I give will probably be, like, obsolete by tomorrow because I feel like stuff moves on so quickly. Um, I guess try to work out what makes your game or you or whatever it is you're trying to market unique and just keep reiterating that, like put that in your design. Um, like if you're going to places, like be the personification of, of, of your unique stuff somehow. Ooh, personification of your uh, unique. Yeah, that, that's really cool to do. What resources should we uh, use today to get started? Uh, it depends what you want to try to do, right? Like if you want to do level design, I, I mean, I have no idea what to do about level design because I'm no, no good at that. But I would probably just say, play a bunch of different games i think seeing other games is really a good resource and also just keep living life because if we all made games that are like other games then we're just going to end up in these little loops so keep living your life and use bits of your life to pull into games do you got an example of uh, a situation when you did that uh edible games (laughs) yeah you know, like I love baking and it's and it's funny, like it feels like I've as you know, as I said, I've been baking for colleagues for a long time. So when I tell people, Oh, I'm combining games and cooking, they're like, Oh wow, you're a great chef and now you're making yeah, you know, like it just it just works. Are you gonna be baking like at the next big event? Or how how does how do you bring edible games to like a big event? Well, I, I generally don't. It's a little oh. too restrictive. Um, but if I do, I need to like make really big estimates on um, like how many people are going to be there, how many hours is going to be there. And yeah, I have to bake everything beforehand and then try to like if it's not in my local city, then I've got to work out how to transport it. So it's it's a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> oh, yeah, I would imagine. And do you get like user feedbacks on your on your edible games as well? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I I do, yeah. Oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. I mean, it was, it was funny, like, I think when I was, when I baked for Indiecade, people were not expecting to, it to actually taste good. They're like, oh, this is actually tasty. And I'm <laughs> like, yes, I'm not going to torture you. <laughs> what, what did they think about the game itself? Like, when, oh, yeah, can you, like, tell us real quick, like, how do you actually play the game? Uh, one of the game, I guess you could explain, like, how do you play it and... Like does someone lose and then they have to eat something or does someone succeed they eat like well, what's how is one of the game played well so they they all they all work quite differently generally because my goals are friendship curiosity and challenge i have um not a very strong winner loser um although some of them do have a winner loser um the game that i was showing at indicate is called the order the order of the oven mitt where you're attempting to become a knight of the oven mitt and um the board's kind of set up like a chess board um but you've got like these little squares with different um lollies or candies on top of them and you move like a chess knight and when you land on one of the sacred squares which are the dark squares you eat it in a silly ritual which is fun and makes you look stupid um, and everyone laughs. Um, And then you end up with a hole on the board and then you get to push pieces around so you can push um, the different lollies away from other people or towards them. So winning that game is basically all of the sacred squares have been eaten and you can work with or against the other person or team members in terms of like if you really like the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, you can – uh, you can try to stop them from getting it or maybe you can come up with a deal with them. You're like, okay, I'll give you the, I'll give you this if you give me that. And so there's actually a bunch of strategy involved. I, I'm like, I, I like asking about Edinburgh games because I, I just love food. So, so I'm just really <laughs> curious about it all the time. Now, this next question is a bit of a doozy. So take your time if you need to. Imagine you woke up the next morning in a brand new world and you knew no one. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have today. Your food and shelter is taken care of and you have a laptop. What would you do step by step on the path to become successful in the game industry? Uh, I would look for like-minded people um, and other um, and like meetups of other people. And then I would, from learning from people who know more than me, I would work out what, what to do next. And in terms of game design, like, is there a step by step you could help us out with to to become successful as a, a, a game designer? 
I think it's just start making games and seeing whether other people find them interesting as well um, and seeing what resonates with you and what stories or mechanics or art you want to get across um, and just being true to yourself. Oh, yes. Get started, game devs. We have reached the end. Go ahead and give us a, a parting piece of guidance in how we can connect with you and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, sure. You can follow me on Twitter at Jen Sandercock and on my personal website, jensand.com. I've got like a newsletter for my edible games if you want to find out about that and a bunch of stuff about some of my other projects. And what's a party piece of guidance you want to leave us? Be true to yourself. Like, yeah, know, know who you are and keep learning who you are and don't let other people tell you how to be. Jen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And for that, we are truly grateful. And we'll catch you and next time. Thank you, Game Devs, for listening. And don't forget that knowledge is only potential power. Execution is the game. So take action. Go to GameDevLoadout.com and type in the number 70 in the search bar to find Jen episode for all the awesome show notes that we just talked about today. Until then, keep on making great games. And I'll catch you next Wednesday on the Game Dev Loadout podcast. Peace.